Well, let me invite your attention this morning uh, to the book of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, of course, it continues that heavenly throne section that we began last week in chapter 4. Revelation chapter 5, I'm going to read the entirety of the text from chapter 5 and then we'll pause in prayer and ask for the work of the Spirit as we try to understand this word God desires to communicate to us. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greatest glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. He wrote, we stood and stared at the letter as it lay on the doormat. It was a sharp envelope. Good quality paper with clear, bold, typewritten name and address. And at the top, in even larger letters, we saw the words to be opened by a dressy only. And the dressy was not at home. We hardly dared to touch it. But supposing this morning the envelope had said to be opened by the person who deserves to do so, uh, that would have been even more intriguing and would have posed a whole different kind of challenge. I mean, after all, how do you know if you deserve to open it? As one writer put it, we are all overdrawn 
at the moral bank. The thought of being sufficiently deserving for any task at once makes us search our consciences and discover all kinds of things which might disqualify us for whatever the task is at hand. And that's the situation that we start with in this scene. We are still looking through John's eyes at the heavenly throne room. And it's not simply one long uh, round of endless repetitive praise. No, this is the throne room of God, the creator of heaven and earth. And his world is not merely a tableau, a living picture to be enjoyed. His world is a project. It's going somewhere and there's a lot of work to be done. There's work to be done to rescue the creation from the deadly dangers that have taken root within it. There's a lot more work to be done to overthrow the forces that are out to destroy the very handiwork of God. And that in itself would be a terrible task and all of us would from that shrink ourselves, but Of course, uh, we've all made it the worse by being part of the problem ourselves rather than part of the solution. And that's at the heart of this challenge that we read about in verses 1 and 2 in the opening of this scene. A mighty angel presents this challenge when he says there's a scroll in the hand of the architect, of the creator. And you can imagine a scroll uh, rolled up in the hand of an architect or um, in the hand of a building manager. A scroll sealed with seven seals. In other words, it's not going to be opened unintentionally. Nowhere in this particular passage are we told what is in that scroll. But we rightly sense, especially as we continue our journey in the book of Revelation, that in fact the whole book of Revelation or the whole of the future purposes of God depend on what is written in this scroll and on its seals being broken open. Now what we will discover is that this scroll contains God's secret plan to undo and overthrow the world destroying projects that have already gained so much ground in this world. It contains his secret plan uh, to nurture the world rescuing project which will get creation itself back on the right track in the right direction. And so the mighty angel asked this question in the opening scene, is there anybody out there who is able to open the scroll? Is there anybody who has not themselves contributed in some way to the problems of creation, to the age-old spoiling and trashing of God's beautiful world? Anybody? Is there anybody out there? John, his answer shows that Like the rest of the New Testament, he had a realistic view of the deep-rooted problem of all the human race. For as we learn in verse 3, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one could open the scroll. 
And that constitutes a major problem. For God, the Creator Himself, way back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, worked within His creation and planned to work within His creation through obedient humanity. That's how the world was designed to work. That's how it was structured to work through obedient man and woman. And so for God to say, well, (laughs) humans have failed. So I guess I'll have to do something different in another way. That would have been to unmake the very structure of his good creation. In other words, to turn this universe into a different sort of world entirely from what we know. Someone must be found. Perhaps then from within the traditions of Israel, somebody might respond. After all, Israel was called to be God's true humanity, to put God's rescue plan into operation. That is true. Uh, Though John doesn't say this plainly in the text, He certainly understood that here we would meet a second level of the problem. For Israel too has failed God. They've let God down. And so here again, God appears to be faced with a dilemma. Uh, Can he say, well, you know, Israel hasn't done what I'd hoped So I'll just have to cut that little bit out of my plan and start with uh, plan C, perhaps. To do that would appear to be as though he blundered. Maybe he was just flailing about with different ideas and none of which were working. So you're no one who can open the scroll. God has made his world in such a way that his plan for this world must be executed by a human being. Oh, God could open it. There's no doubt about that. But it must be operative through humanity. Since human sin now means that those plans now require a rescue operation, God has called one human family to be the means through which this rescue plan will be put into effect. And so what we find in this opening scene is that God has, in in other words, determined to run the world through humanity and to rescue the world through Israel. Therein lies the problem, for both have let him down. What will he do now? Does anyone deserve to open the scroll? Is there no one who can bring to pass the plans and purposes of God And as the mighty angel asks the question, silence falls across heaven. John himself, we learn in verse 3, simply falls down weeping. We might join John in the flood of tears At this point, for there would be no hope for humanity. Can nothing be done? But even as John is weeping, even as the apostle is coming apart at his seams, even in that moment, God already has enacted a plan in which all tears would be wiped away from all eyes. And so one of the angels comes forward and says, don't cry. Look, look, here is one who can do it. 
And so in verse 5, he points us to look at the one who can do it. But oh, even before you look, even before you looked at the text, you knew who this was. It's the truly human one. It's the true Israelite. It is the Messiah. But, but John's vision uh, does nothing straightforwardly. Because everything must be seen in its multi-dimensional glory. And so John's not merely invited to look at the true Israelite, the true human, the Messiah. He's called to look in verse 5 at the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And if you were built up and if you uh, know the scriptures front to back, and if you heard the text that was read for us by Chad, right now, echoing in the chambers of your mind, rumbling throughout the hallways, perhaps getting some of the cobwebs out of the way, you think of prophecies and perhaps visions. The Messiah, the Messiah, oh, he comes from David's tribe. The tribe of Judah. And if you, look, if you reached back really far, you would learn in one, only one other place that Judah was described in Genesis 49, verse 9, as a lion's cub. That phrase was picked up through ancient apocalyptic literature that many of the Jewish people would have cut their teeth on. And so perhaps you could be excused for missing that reference. But listen, no first century Jew would have missed the reference or failed to understand the phrase, the root of David. A phrase which echoes that great Messianic prophecy from Isaiah chapter 11 that Chad read about. As we would expect of the true Messiah, we're not simply told that he only deserves to open the scroll, but we're told in verse 5 that he has conquered. He has won the victory and thus won the right to open this scroll. Oh, it was thought in John's day that the Messiah would fight and win the decisive battle against the last great enemy of God's people and so liberate God's people once and for all. Well, good news for us today because the elder indicates in verse 5 that the Messiah indeed has done it. He has won. And here he is. And John takes us to what may be one of the most decisive moments in all of Scripture. Remember what John heard. He heard the announcement of the lion. But oh, in verse 6, look what he sees. The lamb. He, he's to hold in his head while gazing with his eyes at a lamb. And he's to hold what he is seeing a lamb while he reflects on what he's heard. A lion. These two are radically different ideas. A lion is the symbol of ultimate power, of supreme royalty. While the lamb symbolizes gentle vulnerability. And through its sacrifice, 
the ultimate weakness of death. But the lion and the lamb are now to be fused together completely and forever. And so from this moment on, John and we, as the readers of the book of Revelation, are to understand the ways of God, that the victory won by the lion is accomplished through the sacrifice of the Lamb. Power through weakness. That's God's way. And no other way. We're also to understand that what has been accomplished by the Lamb's sacrifice is not merely the wiping away of the sin for a, a few people here and there. No, the victory won by the Lamb is God's lion-like victory through His faithful Israel in person, through His obedient humanity in person, over all the forces of corruption and darkness and death, over everything that would destroy and wipe out God's good, powerful, and lovely creation. And He did this in the lion lamb. Remember, as we listen and look at verse 7, we're told that this lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. That's to say he is all powerful and all seen. And he has the right to take the scroll and to open it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, carries out God's plan of salvation for this world in this dual approach, this dual capacity of lion and lamb. It's in this twin role of conquering king and of suffering lamb that he breaks the seals and opens the book of the scroll. And did you note, that scroll, unlike the typical scroll, this scroll was written on front and back, all to communicate that it is the unalterable, unchangeable decrees of God. It is complete, the plan of a holy, sovereign God and the twin king suffering servant has won the right to open it. Now, if you didn't think that was shocking enough, now comes the real shock. In fact, you may want to buckle up your seats before you take off. For John, in describing the scene, brings us to the third section of this scene in which he's going to indicate to us that we aren't mere spectators, but that we are participants. We are actors in God's work. Look what he says at verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The music is stirred up. And we're ready to march in and do our part. And it's right here in the opening of this scene when the elders fall down in front of the Lamb. These angels are holding two objects, a harp and a bowl of incense. And John tells us plainly what the incense is. It's the prayers of God's people. That, that's prayers of you and me. And so the heavenly scene is umbilically related to the earthly, the, the, the ordinary, faithful, 
humble prayers of Christians like you and me here on earth appear in heaven as glorious, sweet smelling incense at the throne. Your prayers today appear. But not only that, I, I suspect the same is true of the music with the heavenly harps corresponding to the songs of our hearts, however feeble and out of tune that they are at times when we are singing God's praise with our life, they are being presented at the heavenly throne room of God. And you notice the songs that, that are being sung. Three different songs with three different themes, all praising Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the first of the three songs in this passage, in verses 9 and 10, we find that the Lamb is being praised, not just for rescuing us, but for turning us from hopeless rebels into useful servants from sin slaves into a kingdom of priests, from rubbish into royalty. This is our part. We're a kingdom and priest. We're servants of the high king. We're blue bloods, royalty, in God's family, the Lamb has set us free to stop being spectators in this world, to become an actors in God's drama of creation and redemption and new creation, to play a part in the marching forth of the kingdom of God. And we hear this song that rises up in three different sections, not just with excitement and eager fascination, but we're intended to hear this song with a sense of vocation. When we hear this song, we're to be called up into it that we might hear our marching orders and serve God in whatever ways God has gifted and equipped us to serve Him. So first, the praise of the Lamb in verses 9 and 10 is for what He's done. It's what He's achieved. He, he's indeed worthy to take and open the scroll. He's worthy to be the agent to carry forward God's plan of rescue to destroy the destroyers, to thwart the forces of evil, to confront the seemingly all-powerful, and to establish his new order. And you get to be involved in that. That's what you're doing. You're marching in this world, proclaiming the kingdom. And though it looks pretty ordinary to you and me, it's God's rescue plan being affected through his people. And how has the Lamb done this? Look at the last phrase of verse 9. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now any first century Jew would know what this meant that through his own death and by his blood he ransomed the people. They knew that would be death seen as a sacrifice. Moreover, to turn a people into a kingdom of priests from every tribe and language and people and nation, they knew in order to purchase a people, that would be the ultimate Passover sacrifice, the final fulfillment of what God has done in history when he set his people free from where? From slavery in Egypt, which sets off all these other little exoduses throughout history. That's how he makes a royal priesthood. And the Jewish people of that day would have known that's what he's referring to, a new exodus. A grand exodus 
But John's not only using one biblical passage, as we've noted earlier, the book of Revelation is over 72% of, of allusions to Old Testament words. He's not only talking about the Exodus event in the book of Exodus, but he's also echoing the great passage from Daniel chapter 7, where after the raging of those monsters in that vision of Daniel 7, there is the vindication of one, you remember, one like a son of man? That God establishes this one's rule over the whole earth in and through the people of the holy ones of the Most High. And look at verse 10. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. You are the Most High. In other words, the rescue effected in Daniel is hinted at here as the great new exodus that's what God is doing. John's picking up on those storylines. Only now, John's putting together for us the slaughtered Passover lamb with the vindicated, risen son of man. This breathtaking move is made possible as Jesus comes as man and takes on both calls, both roles. So the first song praises the Lamb for rescuing a people by his death so that they could then take forward God's royal and redemptive purposes for this world. Well, if the first song praises the Lamb for what He's achieved. The second song praises the Lamb for what He deserved. Namely, all the honor and glory of which creation is capable. Did you notice in verses 12 and 13, or verse 12, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing Verse 11, we're told all the living creatures and the elders and the voice of myriads and myriads, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels all gathered around. And do you notice the focus of their worship? It was not them, was it? It wasn't they have a good day. It wasn't that they feel good. It wasn't that they um, have some kind of spiritual blessing. No, all their praise is directed to the throne. All their worship is God-centered. All their worship is to the Lamb who, like a lion, has won the victory and has redeemed his humanity. Isn't it sad today how the church has flip-flopped worship? And now for most of the church in America at least, Worship is not about this holy God who has made us and heaven and earth. Worship now becomes about me. What I like, what I want, what makes me feel good, what gets me up and moving, how I might have a blessing. It's almost as though we have turned this lion lamb into some kind of heavenly bellhop. God forbid. He's not here to do our bidding, folks. He is God, the lion lamb, who has won the victory. And so we come in to bring our paltry lives and say, God, bring them in order with you. Make us what you would have us be. Forgive us where we have failed. Empower us to go back into this world to live for your glory this week. Well, if the first song praises him for what he's achieved and the second song praises the Lamb for what he's deserved, this third song praises him for what he shares. Listen, if your mind's not already overwhelmed 
Take a glimpse. Take a look at verse 13 where the song begins. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Did you hear what John is saying? The most profound truth of all. The Lamb shares the praise which belongs to the one and only God. This is John's way of communicating this mind-challenging but central truth at the heart of the Christian faith. Jesus, the Lion Lamb, Israel's Messiah, the true man, this Jesus shares the worship which belongs uniquely and only belongs to the Creator God and Jesus shares that worship. Do we understand what that means? It's the affirmation. It's the truth of the full, without question, unequivocal divinity, godness of the lion lamb. But, oh, friend, you can't just hear this in abstract. Say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. No, no, no. Look what happens in context. It's not just enough to agree with the idea. God is the creator who is intimately involved with his world. He's worshipped by that world. He has his plans and purposes to deliver this world from its spoiled condition And it's the heart of those plans that we find here where the lion lamb shares the throne of God. In other words, when you recognize this truth, you bow down with your life and you offer it to the Father. When you recognize Jesus Christ is God, and he died for you, you don't take it glibly. You bow your heart. You say, Lord, here am I. Send me. C.T. Studd, a great English cricketer who who became a missionary in China and South India and then later in Sudan and the South Congo is really known for these words. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, which is the gospel, then is anything too great for me to give to him. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, which is the gospel, is anything too great for me to give for him? Is it? Let's pray. Father, have mercy upon us. And fill us with your spirit. That as we remember a body broken for us, blood spilled for us. that we would be willing to say, here am I, Lord. Use me. In Christ we pray. Amen.